enamana, ena iwi, enamana, ena hua mahi, tēnā koutou katoa. E mihi ana ki a koutou, kua tai mai ki te tō toku tēnā kōpapa. Nā mihi nui ki a Michael Brennan, te kai korero o te rā, tēnā koe. Ko James Toko Noa, nō mai hari mai ki te tai ohanga. Uh, welcome everyone, and uh, it's really great to see everyone online. Um, we're here to hear um, today's from today's speaker, uh, Michael Brennan, and this is a, a Treasury Guest Lecture Series for those of you who hopefully are in the right spot. Um, I'm really looking forward to this talk, so um, and the discussion will follow. So um, we we'll welcome everyone. And this seminar is centered around our current theme, which is about uh, productivity in a changing world, and we've chosen this theme. Um, because, you know, as, as we all know, productivity is a crucial long-run driver of economic performance, higher wages and overall well-being. The world's changing around us rapidly. Um, there's a uh, presenting the challenge of lifting productivity among significant economic, social and environmental shifts. Like, like many other countries, New Zealand is navigating these changes in a dynamic global context. So it's a pretty uh, interesting time, very challenging time. Um, and that's why we're um, decided to go with this uh, theme for us for our series. Um, we've had a, a diverse uh, range of speakers and, and more to come um, to explore these mega trends and how they impact New Zealand's productivity and more broadly how our economic performance uh, reliance and sustain and, and how it affects our economic performance uh, resilience and sustainability. Um, these trends suggest uh, a need for substantial adaptation in our economy to ensure sustainable productivity and economic performance. So please keep an eye out for those uh, invitations for these lectures. Um, we've got a, um, we've had and we have continued to have an impressive lineup of uh, inspiring experts. Today we're really delighted to have uh, Michael Brennan, uh, Brennan joining us. Um, Michael is the chair of the Australian Productivity Commission. In the commission, he's currently working on uh, closing the gap. Uh, the Closing the Gap Review Study. Michael's also worked on uh, the Productivity Inquiry, National School Reform Agreement and Expenditure on Children in the Northern Territory. Michael's five-year term as the Chair uh, is coming to an end and so we really appreciate it, Michael, that you're um, joining us as one of your last uh, official engagements. So thank you for that. Prior to the role, Michael was De Deputy Secretary of Fiscal Group at the, uh, Fed the Federal Treasury. Um, with responsibility for budget policy, retirement incomes, Commonwealth state relations and social policy and infrastructure financing. And before that, Michael was the Deputy Secretary Economic at the Victoria Department of Treasury and Finance. And he's also worked as an Associate Director in Economics and Policy Practice at the uh, at PricewaterhouseCoopers, if you have not see. Um, so, Today's uh, seminar, Michael will share uh, findings of the Australian Productivity Commission's recently re released five-year productivity report called Advancing Prosperity. The report focuses on five key uh, reform pillars aimed at Australian productivity growth over coming years. The recommended reforms are designed to enable Australia to capitalise on global technological opportunities and to overcome productivity challenges in the areas where growth has been historically harder to achieve, particularly in the services sector. Given that we face the same technological opportunities and share some of the same challenges with Australia, I have no doubt Michael's insights will be of great value to us all. Um, I'm going to hand over to Michael, um, who will present for about 45 minutes, and then we will have the remainder of time for questions and, and discussions. We'll use the Q&A uh, function in Teams for moderating a discussion, so please post your questions there. Um, so that's just the... the uh, rather than the chat, so that's really important. Um, uh, if you have any technical queries, please use the standard chat function. We can uh, endeavour to help you online. So with all that, um, I'll head over to you, Michael, and once again, welcome. Well, thank you very much, James. It, it's great to be here uh, virtually uh, with you today. And uh, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of, of the land where I am, the Wurundjeri people, uh, and acknowledge uh, and pay respect to elders past and present. Um, both in this role and in my previous jobs that James outlined, we've enjoyed a terrific partnership and collaboration with our New Zealand uh, 
counterparts, uh, both both in the Treasury and at the New Zealand Productivity Commission. And I just wanted to mention that it's it's terrific, as you say, James, uh, kind of on the way out. But it's great to um, as as one of my last uh, official engagements to be taking part in this series. And I, I really endorse the importance of this series. And uh, hopefully today we can um, glean a few insights, um, particularly in combination with the other speakers that you've got as, as part of the part of the show. Um, I'm going to try and share my screen and that's going to test my technological capability. But while I'm doing that, I'll just acknowledge, as James said, that um, this report is essentially one that went to government earlier in the year and was released in March. And it's part of what will what is intended to be a series, a five yearly series of looks at Australia's productivity performance. The first of its kind was in 2017. That was a report called Shifting the Dial. This is the second of its type. And there's a lot of common ground between the two, as you'd anticipate, because not much changes in a five year period. Uh, that said, a fair bit did change um, between 2017 and 2023, and uh, so six years in that case. And it was important, I think, for us to try and capture some of that, that contextual change. Uh, for the purpose of this audience, perhaps I don't really need to reprise the uh, importance of productivity growth in improving living standards. I'm just assuming that you're seeing these slides and uh, everything's working just fine, but you know, please let me know if that's not the case. Uh, improved productivity growth over the years has underpinned um, rises in material living standards. And even in a world where logically we're trying to think about well-being as being broader than just, say, GDP per capita, it's still important to note that th the rise of living standards broadly based uh, has been driven by the sorts of factors that have driven GDP per capita as well. We tried hard in this process to try and broaden the the perception of productivity growth away from a kind of narrow market based purely being about gdp per capita sort of notion we noted that productivity growth over the journey tends to take uh kind of three main manifestations one is all of those everyday things goods and services that become radically cheaper and more plentiful thereby uh kind of via the form of real cost reductions but also those things that improve in quality. We notice that in terms of products, but we notice in terms of services, the quality of various services uh, compared to say 100 years ago, the quality of a consultation with a doctor, for example, it's nothing like what it was, uh, a trip to the dentist. Uh, it's unimaginable you know, <laughs> to think about what that would have been 100 years ago. So quality matters. Uh, and of course, the, the entirely new things that, that come along that we imperfectly try to slot into our calculations of gross domestic product, uh, but it's hard to think of, you know, the role that a new invention, an, an mRNA vaccine or air conditioning or antibiotics or electricity, for example, the impact that that, that has. I think it's worth reprising these things, though, because I think that particularly in a modern economy, in a modern society, for many people, the concept of productivity growth has perhaps become a little less intuitive than perhaps it was uh, in a bygone era when uh, more of the workforce and a bigger share of the economy was devoted to the traditional goods sectors of agriculture, manufacturing, mining, I think areas where the concept of productivity growth, the idea of what output we get for the inputs that we put in is highly intuitive. Perhaps it's less so for somebody working today uh, as a disability carer or an aged care nurse or somebody in the finance industry or somebody serving coffee uh, in a coffee shop. You know, what is this concept of productivity growth, productivity, why is it relevant to me? It's also, I think, difficult to sometimes grasp what a rise in living standards might mean. One of the points that we've made about the slowing of productivity growth in recent years, which I'll come to, is that even a relatively small change in the percentage point growth rate of productivity from year to year can make a big difference if, if it's compounded over a long period in terms of the time it might take, for example, to double average incomes. Um, the difference between 1.8% per year, which was the 60 year average in Australia, and 1.1% per year is a difference between average incomes doubling every 39 years compared to taking more than 70 years to double. I think part of the challenge with that is that it's not altogether intuitive or not altogether easy to grasp what it really means for living standards to double. Uh, 
for the average person, if they're thinking in purely material terms, they might think, oh, well, I've got, you know, do I need twice as many clothes or do I need twice as much food? No, not really. Um, I've, I've got, you know, a couple of TVs in the house, whatever it is, you know, what, it, what does it really mean? I mean, one of the ways that productivity growth in the past has manifested is a, a different labour leisure choice. I use the word leisure advisedly, but the, a different set of choices about the use of time between paid work and other things. Uh, there's tended to be a reduction in average hours worked, which is a way that we take part of the dividend of productivity growth. It's only a small part, admittedly. But it's possible that that's the most intuitive thing that people could grasp about the prospects of future growth. If we can achieve the same sort of improvement in how rich we are, if you like, per capita uh, over coming decades, then it might be that the, re the relevant dividend is going to be felt much more in uh, a scaling back of average hours worked. Maybe there's more flexibility to do more non-work things. Maybe it is the four-day work week. Uh, who knows? But it might be that that's the most concrete, most tangible thing that people can potentially grasp about the role that productivity growth uh, could, could, could play going forward. And notwithstanding the point about slowing productivity growth, I think it's also important contextually to note that productivity growth in the grand sweep of human history is a very recent phenomenon, uh, really only about 200 years old. If you think about the well-being of the average English farmer of 1700, it didn't compare that, it wasn't that different to what had been the lot of the average yeoman farmer of you know, six, 700 years prior. But of course, a lot changed in in particularly in the 200 years uh, since the early 1800s. And that's really about the rise in commercial society. And when you see in this chart the what's happened just in the period um, since the. Uh, sorry, I'll go, I'll go back in the. Um, the period since 1900, you know, the, the what what's on the vertical axis here. Uh, the rise of, of you know, six or seven times um, average incomes over a, a hundred year period, that really underscores just how dramatically um, in incomes have risen from a period where for thousands of years incomes really didn't, didn't change much at all. My own view is that economists traditionally have been remarkably incurious about this fact, and I think it's partly because economics has become a kind of what I'll describe as an equilibrium discipline in a world where we focus very much on equilibrium outcomes, the idea that firms maximise their efficiency and thereby their profit on the back of a known production function, putting in capital, putting in labour according to a kind of well accepted and understood recipe. It becomes very difficult to explain why it is that each year the amount of output grows by more than the rise in inputs. And this was kind of traditionally regarded as the unexplained residual. So it was almost a nuisance for the purposes of neoclassical equilibrium economic models. But of course, as far as governments are concerned, as far as policymakers are concerned, as far as people are concerned, that nuisance residual is actually the main game. That's the thing that explains why it is that we're richer from year to year. And it's the thing that we want to try and explain. And for the most part, the sort of growth models that economists have postulated to try and explain or endogenize some aspect of the growth process, whether it's that there's constant technological change that just keeps shocking the system, um, which is really an external uh, pressure, whether it's capital deepening, whether it's education, which leads to high quality labor, or the idea that the concept that ideas are non-rival and therefore there's sort of increasing returns to investing in research. All of these efforts to try and explain the tendency of, of growth to occur, growth per capita to occur as a result of productivity, um, kind of end up looking to me a little bit, uh, well, fine as uh, in terms of a broad ex explanatory variable, but probably not giving you a huge amount of guidance about policy or about the concrete reality. Um, the American economist Arnold Harberger once posed the question, you know, what does growth, productivity growth really look like? Does it take on the appearance of yeast? In other words, is it like the whole economy rising consistently by a sort of 1.5% sort of rate across the board, all firms, all sectors, et cetera? Or is it more like mushrooms? In other words, different bits that sort of rise by different amounts and, and show this kind of erratic sort of pattern. And, and he concluded it's a lot more like the mushrooms than it is like the yeast. It's a very uneven process. It's a very unpredictable process. 
individual sectors, individual firms at various times race ahead in terms of their productivity performance. And perhaps the best reason we can think of as to why at an economy wide level, we tend to observe the sort of rise in productivity growth is, is the very nature of that un unevenness. The fact that certain firms, certain sectors are moving ahead faster and there's a tendency of the economy to try and play catch up with those um, frontier firms or frontier sectors. So what you really want is an economy where new things are being tried uh, and then uh, both in terms of technology, but also the complementary business innovations that go with them, um, but also that reward success in the right way, such that resources start to gravitate towards the successful experimentation that's occurring in parts of the economy. And you want to know that both of things, both of those things are present in the economy, that the tendency to innovate, but uh, an economy that works well, in effect, to, to shift resources to those parts that are, that are relatively successful. Uh, we wanted to talk a bit about some of the um, the context of the present day, because in thinking about productivity and its challenges, we, we wanted to make sure that we were very much uh, anchoring our work in the, the particular challenges of Australia in the present, not something that could be generically written of any developed economy at any period, you know, at any point in the last 20 or 30 years. It is the case uh, that as I mentioned, productivity growth, annual average productivity growth has slowed um, relative to the 60 year average, uh, the last decade being the, the slowest productivity growth that Australia has uh, experienced over the last 60 years. Of course, uh, that's not unique to Australia. It's not unique to New Zealand. That is a developed world phenomenon. Uh, and there are many reasons as to why that might be the case. And I'll come to a couple of key ones. But we wanted to kind of put uh, a bit of a a current context around this. So we did talk about a few particular challenges, one being, the, as James alluded to, the fact that the nature of the world has changed in geostrategic terms, uh, the rise of trade flows and investment in the post-war period has been a significant um, underpinning of productivity growth across the world. Um, Australia and New Zealand, particularly as we belatedly opened ourselves to, to trade flows in the 1970s, 1980s, uh, definitely gained the benefit of that. It's been a significant tailwind for us as small open economies, you know, exporting into the world. Um, that's got some challenges today. And that's one of the, the issues that we that we um, that we did talk about. James also alluded to climate policy, which is going to be a very, very significant determinant of productivity growth in the period ahead, because it's just such a massive undertaking. It's a it's a very significant industrial undertaking, among other things, to achieve net zero emissions. Um, particularly in areas like the energy sector, and the efficiency and effectiveness with which we do it will be a big determinant of, of how we go on the overall productivity question. But one of the other significant things, um, which is not a new story, but it's a significant story nonetheless, is the rise of services. Back in the 1950s, as I mentioned, half of the Australian workforce, it'd be very similar in New Zealand, uh, was in the agriculture, mining and manufacturing sector. <clears throat> the only thing that would be different would be the relativities, but agriculture would have been bigger in New Zealand than in Australia. As, as I mentioned, those traditional goods sectors, uh, they saw very significant productivity growth over the course of the 20th century, largely through the application of science, the application of technology, the substitution of, of capital bring, coming in for labour. Um, but more recently, as, as those sectors have declined as a share of GDP and a share of the workforce, the services sector has risen. And whilst the services sector is pretty heterogeneous, uh, it is the case that productivity growth has tended to be slower in the services sector than in the goods sector. And that's partly as a, as a result of those traditional paths of productivity growth, the, the capital deepening, um, the, the tendency to automate, mass produce, et cetera, that we saw so much of, particularly in agriculture and manufacturing. That's a little harder in the services sector where uh, it's labour intensive, services are often bespoke. Um, it's, it's a little difficult to automate, to mass produce. And so it's, it's proven a bit more of a challenge, I think, to drive the same sort of productivity growth in the services sector. And I won't show a, a chart on this, but it's an interesting parlour game when you look at the CPI over the medium term, obviously in the present, both the Reserve Bank in Australia and New Zealand uh, has been worrying about services inflation. Um, 
when you compare any service component in the CPI to the good that is most closely related to it, so compare medical services to medical products or compare uh, holiday equipment as a good compared with holidays, you know, accommodation, et cetera, uh, the service has always risen by more relatively. Um, you, you won't find a single instance where the good component of the CPI has risen by more than the service. And that's a reflection of the ability to drive a degree of productivity growth in, in the goods sectors, automating production, that sort of thing. And it's partly a function of trade for, for, for our economies, um, but it's just proven stubbornly difficult to drive the same sort of productivity growth in, in services. And this was one of the kind of contextual issues that we were grappling with is the tendency in the light of differential rates of productivity growth across different sectors, ironically, perhaps perversely, for the, the sectors where productivity growth is relatively rapid, if it is, for example, in agriculture, manufacturing, mining in Australia, the tendency for the workforce in those areas to shrink and the tendency for those things to actually become a smaller share, ironically, of, of the economy as resources shift into the areas which have had relatively slow productivity growth because to the extent that those slower productivity sectors are still in demand uh, and consumers are still demanding their output uh, as they can achieve the same output with less labor in in the more progressive sectors uh, they're going to focus more labor more effort more resources on the areas that have been uh, harder to improve and this is a concept uh, known in the economics profession as Bomol's cost disease um, it's not an inevitability, but it is a kind of all things being equal tendency uh, if you if you can't uh, sort of challenge or address the issue of potential differential productivity growth between different sectors. Now, we looked at this particularly in the context not so much of services in aggregate. Of course, services, as I mentioned, are a pretty broad, heterogeneous sort of category. But we thought about it in the context of non-market services in particular. So those services which are primarily funded, delivered, regulated by government in areas like health, education, disability, aged care, childcare, et cetera. Uh, the tendency for these sectors, because of often uh, a very high level of labour intensity, often a regulated labour input, um, the difficulty of driving a lot of productivity growth in those sectors, the challenge that those sectors could continue to grow as a share of the workforce, continue to grow as a share of the economy, and thereby, if they do remain low productivity growth sectors, to kind of be an overall drag on economy-wide productivity growth. Uh, as I say, that's not an inevitability, uh, but it's the backdrop or it's the natural tendency unless we're able to do uh, something about it. So we thought about uh, things in from from three angles you know what are the determinants of, of growth um as i say traditionally economists think of this as being comprised of uh labor capital and technology so human capital in the force of the form of people um the, the level of investment or the ratio of capital and labor but also the, the rate of technological growth that's true in both the market and the non-market sectors i'll come to uh, but we wanted to put a bit of a lens over that of what's the role of government in, in this. We are microeconomists. We're on the lookout for what, what's the market failure, what's the role of government, uh, even if you could establish that uh, investment was a big driver of growth. Well, it doesn't mean the government has to be the driver of the direct driver of all of that investment, for example. But as I said, the headwinds to productivity we wanted to focus on, we wanted to think a bit about what are the specific things that shape the challenge and they shape it for Australia, they shape it for New Zealand um, as well. And we arrived at the five areas that James mentioned uh, at, the, at the beginning, a human capital element about building an adaptable workforce, uh, a particular focus on innovation and the diffusion of new ideas and technology through the economy, uh, the creation of a more dynamic economy being in a way, the best way of diffusing those ideas across the economy, a focus on the non-market sector, and of course, this particular issue about climate and the ability to achieve net zero at the lowest possible cost, noting that, that there will be some cost. So I'll just give you a few reflections on each of those areas, um, and I'll economise a bit on this so that we open it up for questions and discussion at the end. But I'll start with the human capital story. Noting that, as I said, services are tend to be a bit more labour intensive. So the quality of the labour input, both the, if you like the quality of labour, but also the organisation of that labour are very important. 
one of the things about both manufacturing and agriculture traditionally is that they were able to take workers with relatively low formal qualifications and effectively create quite high paying jobs, basically because they were mixing that labour uh, with significant capital um, and some IP around you know, a particular product. The services sector tends to be a little less forgiving. There are high paying and there are low paying jobs. There are certainly jobs for people without a lot of formal qualifications, but they do tend to be low paying. And it's now the case that around nine out of 10 new jobs are estimated to require uh, some um, some uh, post school qualification, whether it's a vocational certificate or a university degree. Uh, it's also the case that non routine jobs are on the rise relative to routine jobs. That's both non routine cognitive jobs, but also uh, non routine manual jobs, particularly in areas like the caring sector, much more so than than routine roles. Um, routine cognitive roles will probably con continue to see with the rise of AI, uh, the, the ability to automate some of those. So we put a focus on the various aspects of um, of uh, education, uh, skilled migration and labour market regulation to, to try and think about the quality of labour and, and how it's organised. One of the sort of sub themes is that in a lot of our areas of policy, and I think it's similar though not identical in New Zealand, is that we still in many ways tend to have in a number of areas, quite an occupational focus. So, for example, in our vocational education and training system, we do think about training people for very specific occupations. Uh, and that, that's what the nature of the training package is really doing. Um, with our skilled migration, we very much base it on lists of occupations which are deemed to be in skill shortage in the domestic economy. Um, we still have a quite a complex system of industrial awards, which again enshrine pay rates and conditions around occupational specification and of course occupational licensing by definition is something that is very occupationally based. Whereas more and more in a modern economy we have to be thinking about broad capabilities, the adaptability of, of, of the workforce, whether that's in the skills formation or who it is that we're bringing in as skilled migrants um, and the, the way we regulate labour in, in its use across the economy. So for the purposes of education, um, you know, one of the things that we noted was we've made big gains in the past through just the rise in educational attainment, the rise of the years of schooling over the course of the 20th century. That's still happening to some extent with higher education, but largely in a world where most people are finishing school, we don't get kind of easy productivity gains from higher quality of labour as a result of more years of schooling. We, we have to go back to a, a quality issue. Um, we have to get more out of the inputs that we're putting in, the years of schooling, the resources we're putting into education. But noting that the education system, whether it's schools or even universities, it, it looks very similar to what it looked like 50 or 60 years ago in a world that many other business models, um, in a world where other business models have adapted and changed in many other sectors. Uh, I think school education, it looks pretty similar to what it looked like um, many years ago, maybe with a bit more technology, um, but the basic structure of education, of instruction hasn't really changed. And notwithstanding the disruption of COVID, where we move things online, there's been a pretty clear snap back in that area, unlike some other areas like remote work, where, where it's stuck to, to some extent, um, the, the, the change during COVID has sort of stuck. So we felt that, um, particularly with universities, there was, um, sorry, going back to <clears throat> extinct with education for the moment, um, with universities, th there's probably still a bit of a quantity dividend to be derived here. We, we think that there's still scope for some productivity gains associated with expanding uh, the tertiary sector, more students going through university and, and getting higher degrees but with a bit of a shift in emphasis towards quality teaching and an improved student experience. Our universities uh, tend to prioritise research, partly because of what drives international rankings, which in turn drives international student numbers. And um, try and, we, we thought about a number of policy levers to try and shift that emphasis towards the, the quality of the human capital that's being developed in the universities themselves. On vocational education and training, we were thinking a bit about how you can move towards more adaptive skills away from this highly specified set of uh, training packages based on uh, competency-based training. In other words, the units of competency which are deemed necessary for an individual occupation, more towards building these more 
adaptable, generalizable skills, but still in a kind of hands-on vocational setting. Um, we thought a bit about lifelong learning um, and the importance of that, you know, coming from a model where we've tended to, like, like New Zealand, we've tended to focus our government effort, our subsidy, on the initial acquisition of skills in post-school qualification. So schools and then vocational and, and higher ed universities. Um, that's fine. There's in many ways kind of good reason for that. But increasingly, it's likely that uh, consistent with this model that we're trying to build general and adaptable skills in that initial um, phase. Uh, and then there'll be a continued process of learning, both on the job, but through uh, other forms of of kind of structured learning, including micro credentials, short form credentials. And there is a question as to whether we've got the balance absolutely right between the sort of heavy subsidy that we apply to the initial acquisition of skills and the kind of almost zero subsidy or zero public support that we provide to the subsequent uh, training effort that might be underway. Now, of course, as I mentioned earlier, we, we want to think hard about market failure. What, what's the role of government in supporting subsequent uh, training? It's often in the interests of individuals. It's often in the interests of business. But we did explore a few levers like tax incentives that are focused on the individual or focused on the business um, that provide some extra incentive, um, noting that there might be some public good associated with encouraging more of a culture of lifelong learning. Um, we also noted, and we're a federation, uh, which is different to New Zealand, of course, but we do have at the moment a proliferation of various government schemes, federal and state, that that go some place, some way to encouraging uh, lifelong learning or mid-career sort of training options. And we felt that it was better to try and get a more coherent and justified set of interventions rather than that proliferation. Of course, a key consideration in that is you know, how progressive is that effort? What, what are the distributional implications for, in many ways, the sorts of people who are likely to be benefiting from, say, tax incentives in relation to lifelong learning are already um, pretty well skilled, highly skilled, uh, higher income people with a capacity to benefit. There's another whole piece, which is, you know, what efforts can we make to improve the training and capability of say, uh, th those who with low levels of adult literacy and numeracy uh, who are for whom that is basically a barrier to their fuller participation in in a modern economy. We talked a bit about schools and while we, we weren't particularly <clears throat> prescriptive about this, we did sort of pose the broad question of well, what what would a productivity revolution look like in the school system? Um, what What would it look like if schools effectively could pull off the same sort of transformation that, for example, the health sector pulled off over 150 years where the medical profession became highly professionalized uh, to the to the good effect such that life expectancy rose and we can cure all manner of things today that we couldn't do 150 years ago. What, what's the equivalent in schools? How would we engineer a dramatic rise in student achievement uh, and capability? Um, it, potentially even maybe economizing on some of the, the resource input. And there were three broad areas that we thought about. One was technology and, and the scope, particularly for AI, to be playing a role complementing uh, human teacher-led instruction. Um, and I think we've only begin, begun to scratch the surface on that. Also, a clearer connection between classroom practice and evidence-based pedagogy and approaches. At the moment, we've kind of got a bit of a disconnect in Australia between those two. Um, but if we could get a stronger connection between what's the the best evidence saying and what is it that's happening in the classroom and of course getting the data and experience from the classroom to to go back to um if, if you like testing that evidence retesting that evidence then that would be an important element of professionalizing education in the same way that the medical profession became professionalized over the, the last hundred years or so um and a bit of innovation in the overall business model of, of education so we thought that package of things, you know, would, would help drive a bit of an improvement. It's it's a long term journey. It's not single levers that you simply pull and, and it's all done. Um, but it's the broad direction that we want to be heading uh, if we are generating uh, a workforce for the future that, that's well equipped to tackle the challenges of productivity growth. We did talk a bit about skilled migration, and I know it's been a big focus for the New Zealand Productivity Commission as well. And the broad direction there was to move a bit away from uh, lists, um, which we find both bureaucratic, slow to change, and not necessarily 
economically justified in many cases uh, as ways of defining skill shortages. Um, more to things like wage thresholds, which which kind of are a bit more market based, they're a bit provide more of an indication of where employers are valuing a, an individual uh, on the basis of the knowledge and capability that they're bringing in, whether or not they're notionally uh, filling in a, a gap as identified by a skills list. And of course, we felt that some visa categories were, were pretty low performing and um, should be scrapped, some particular types of visas. Um, we've noted, as we've noted before, that the fiscal implications of immigration tend to be a net positive for Australia, uh, depending on the category. Um, that's even more true of the temporary skilled stream. And if anything, we kind of had a view that you could shift a bit towards the temporary skilled away from the permanent skilled. But for the most part, governments like the permanent um, migration category uh, for, for broader reasons. They like the idea that people who come to Australia or New Zealand um, both see themselves and are seen to have a good prospect ultimately of becoming permanent residency residents. And, and I think that's a reasonable sort of thing for governments to think about it, perhaps suggest that the, the narrow economic view doesn't necessarily always prevail. But the broad point about um, you know making sure that the fiscal benefit basically stacks up, um, which for the most part it does, um, and also using the, the both the, the things like wage thresholds in respect of both the permanent and temporary employer sponsored um, skill category um, can make a big difference. Um, James mentioned the importance of innovation and, and diffusion. And, and one of the broad conclusions or, or hypotheses, I guess, that we brought to our work was the fact that we often have a kind of policy reflex when it comes to innovation that says, well, we have certain levers like public support for private R&D, whether it's through a tax concession or a subsidy or a grant or, or whatever, um, maybe some grant funding to our public research institutions. Um, perhaps it's about universities commercialising the IP that they're developing and, and being assisted to do that. And all of those things are very important uh, and they are all drivers of the sort of cutting edge discovery that we want to see, certainly globally, but we ideally like to see it on our own shores. Um, but it's important to recognise that that's a relatively narrow uh, part of the overall innovation story. And particularly in economies like Australia and New Zealand, uh, we noted that, you know, for in Australia, 98% of firms, um, they're not new to the world innovators. They're not necessarily that cutting edge frontier, but they're still very important for the overall productivity performance of the economy because lifting their performance somewhat um, across the board would, would probably be the main game. And so we felt that it was about the 98%. And it's much more a story around how do we encourage, facilitate, make possible the diffusion of ideas from the frontier to the broad mass of Australian firms who are adopters of technology. They're adapters, so they'll make the sort of complementary business innovations that go with technological adoption um, and, and thereby lift, lift their overall productivity performance. So one of the challenges there, of course, is that whilst we have some pretty well recognised policy levers on the cutting edge innovation front, uh, in these areas, you know, it's a little harder to identify what's that role for government. Government clearly does play a role encouraging data use, um, partly through its own use of data. Sometimes it's about data release. Sometimes we have some regulators, including the tax office, that can provide a bit of benchmarking information to individual firms about their own performance. Uh, sometimes it's about framework issues like our consumer data right that, that defines a right for consumers to, to shop around by making their data available to potential competitors. Uh, but the role that regulators play in the sophistication of their own uh, regulatory use, uh, sorry, uh, technology use via reg tech solutions, for example, is often the thing that drives uptake. Um, revenue collection agencies famously drive a lot of technological uptake uh, via um, creating the, the digital interface with, with tax compliance. So whilst it was harder in a way to find that big single policy lever, we, we just identified several little things that we thought helped add up to uh, the, the way we might help to encourage um, the diffusion of technology and ideas uh, across, across the broad economy. Um, the, the issue of market dynamism, um, very significant, you know, is it to my earlier point, you know, do we have economies where uh, success is rewarded where resources 
capital and, land, and labor naturally gravitate towards those firms that are at the frontier? Is that diffusion mechanism working to good effect or is it blocked somewhere along the way? I think these are big questions uh, that both our economies are grappling with. Competition to some extent could be an issue. There is some evidence that there is a de higher degree of market concentration in the Australian economy, some, some rises in measures of markups. But it's a difficult policy area. For the most part, our competition frameworks are pretty good. We can make some small changes to merger laws uh, to other parts of the competition framework. But a lot of this is probably more about the sector specific rules that exist in certain areas, certain industries that create barriers to competition, to new entry, et cetera. Sometimes it's a generic thing like our planning and zoning rules that are creating uh, rigidities around land use, the ability of new businesses to come in in a particular location. So we thought there was a lot of benefit in doing some of the simple things well, remaining open to the world in a world of rising kind of tensions and concern about um, you know, uh, supply chains, uh, trade, geostrategic issues around foreign investment, et cetera, wherever possible, you know, can we maintain openness in, if, to, to goods trade, to the movement of capital as well? Um, so on both on foreign investment and the reduction of the remaining nuisance tariffs in Australia, for example. Um, other areas where we could perhaps reduce regulatory burden, including through technology. Um, we did have a bit of a look at tax and if anything, uh, we didn't want to replicate the work that had been done in the past on big tax changes, uh, but we kind of noted that one area that we might want to look is the extent to which the tax system might militate in favour of or away from new business formation. So we looked at the corporate tax system, whether there might be, it might be time to consider allowances for corporate equity, uh, other instances that might provide a bit more neutrality between firms that finance themselves via equity or debt, um, given that a lot of new firms probably are going to be more in the equity space uh, than, than the debt space to the extent that they're getting external finance at all. We had a little session that section that talked about risk and insurance that was a bit uh, inspired by, stimulated by the work that the New Zealand Productivity Commission did some years ago on, on the digital economy of, of the future. Noting that Australia has a pretty highly developed system of uh, encouraging or mandating savings, um, thereby smoothing consumption over people's life cycles, but a pretty fragmented system of risk protection, be that income protection, noting that Australia and New Zealand, both economies that have relied on a, uh, a redistributive um, income support system as opposed to a, an unemployment insurance system, um, but more broadly, we have insurers and, and areas of insurance which are highly siloed and segmented, highly regulated and prevented from um, getting into, into new areas and trying innovative new things, notably in health insurance, but, but life insurance as well in Australia. Had a little section on location and mobility about how we might free up some locational decisions via the planning and, and zoning systems, but also pricing mobility a little bit more efficiently um, in relation to roads and in relation to, to mass transit. Um, I'll just talk briefly about the non-market economy and, and climate and then make, give you a couple of reflections and finish up. But um, as I mentioned, the non-market economy, so those areas uh, which um, those areas which are predominantly funded by government uh, or even delivered by government, they are rising as a share of employment in the Australian economy. That's partly because of Commonwealth and state government policy. Uh, they are rising as a share of nominal GDP. So their importance to the overall economic story in Australia is rising. They are sectors that have traditionally had pretty low productivity growth. It is always hard to measure, uh, but to the extent even we to the extent we can look at quality adjusted measures, it's very difficult to see that there's been significant productivity gains in an area like school education, for example. But the demand for those services is pretty high and it's likely to grow both due to ageing, not, not in relation to education, but in relation to health, caring, uh, disability, uh, but also rising incomes. In these non-market services, the proximate source of productivity growth is exactly the same as it is in the market sector. It is, you know, technology, capital, labour. Um, so dealing with those in reverse order, the, the quality and configuration of labour will continue to be important, um, noting that many of these roles do require higher qualification, um, but they also require, in addition to technical skills, often th those other human skills like emotional intelligence, the ability to connect, the ability to deliver a service with, with empathy, et cetera, and judgment. 
Um, they do involve the use of capital, albeit they're less capital intensive often than the goods sector, but they do include the use of digital technology. There must be a role potentially for AI. There should be a role even for robotics in, in some areas. Wearables, other, other areas of potential technological advance that could make these services both cheaper and more effective. Um, and it relies on innovation, new ways of doing things. Um, and going back to my earlier point about the fact that you want an economy that both tries new things and then selects for the best things and, and sees that resources sort of flow to those successful models. Um, to some extent, both of those ingredients tend to be lacking in the non-market sector. We tend to have more of a one-size-fits-all uh, government-mandated approach. There's not really a kind of innovation infrastructure around that. Uh, and then, of course, we don't have the disciplines of firm entry and exit, the price system, the idea of you know, that one uh, service provider can expand by gaining market share because it's better. Um, and we have that separation between who's paying for the service, typically government or predominantly government, and who's receiving the service. And that can create a bit of a disconnect in terms of the incentive for cost containment and the cost, the incentive for quality improvement. So we basically identified, you know, there, there are many challenges and many ways that you might try and improve this. We just focused on three. One was via funding models um, and regular, regulatory constraints that effectively lock in particular modes of service delivery. One was by supporting uh, best practice innovation and evidence, a kind of an infrastructure around that. So, for example, we've now got um, a, a body for education, for school education, that is a, a, a determiner and diffuser of evidence uh, to be used in, in the classroom, including teaching materials, um, but also just trying to identify where there is scope to use labour saving technology, noting that this is an area where often the labour input is heavily prescribed inflexibly. Uh, we impose a, a ratio of staff to, to servant uh, service recipients. Um, that's going to be a break, that's going to be a barrier to, to productivity growth. And I think we have to be uh, open to the possibility that there could be uh, in some of these areas some substitution of technology for the human input uh, such that we are getting the, getting the best out of the human input but but not locking into costly labor intensive models talk a bit about climate um, you know it's it is a challenge it's going to be a massive undertaking it's going to be a significant industrial undertaking uh, there will be some inefficiency along the way. That's a given because we don't really know yet what the low, lowest cost technology is to achieve our net zero aims by 2050. Um, but it strikes us that it's still possible to do this better or worse. Um, we we perhaps you know lament the fact that years ago we didn't move to an economy wide, a single economy wide price. And it's not that that's a cure all, uh, but it certainly would have helped to guide investment decisions and uh, focus the innovation task uh, on you know where where can we abate at, at lowest cost we haven't got that it's possible to do something with kind of almost shadow prices in individual areas and i think that is kind of what we're left with but we note that at the moment we have a kind of proliferation of pretty extreme um, prices in many cases um, notably in relation to things like fringe benefits tax concessions on electric vehicles, uh, policy instruments that are effectively imputing a very, very high shadow price to carbon uh, abatement, so in the thousands of dollars per per um, tonne of carbon abated. So it's important for us to try and rationalise these things down to try and get a clearer, um, you know, some closer bounds, I guess, on, on the range of um, prices that effectively operate in 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 relation to carbon in the Australian economy. Um, so we we noted that areas like our existing safeguard mechanism could be expanded. It could be expanded both, you know, the threshold of its application could be reduced, but also it could be expanded to cover a broader range of sectors across the economy. Uh, I'm going to finish there and I'm happy to reflect on some other kind of broad sort of um, thoughts on you know how we approach this task in general but perhaps best to do that in in the q a um session so i'll cease to share my screen and yeah why don't i return to you james thanks uh thanks michael um my run sheet says um q a from tw 220 and it's now 220 so um well done on your timing it's absolutely perfect in terms of your
uh, presentation. So thank you, Michael. Um, really good uh, discussion there. I, I, um, I've got a few questions I've got, but I'll, I'll turn to the um, box. I might just bring in mine as we go through. Um, thank you very much. Um, so we've got a couple of questions here. I'll start with um, Daisy's question, which was uh, around the how, how do we measure? Sorry, I just moved this up on my computer. How do we measure improved quality in services uh, for the purpose of measuring productivity growth? Um, how can we see improvement in, in services from, say, doctors and dentists? So I think you touched a little bit on that as you went through, but is there anything further you want to say on that? And I guess one of the other questions I had was just how, you know, what's the state of, of play in terms of, particularly around that, that non market sector? In terms of measuring productivity, are we seeing improvements in that? Or is it, well, I mean, it's been always been, as you say in your um, presentation, like it's been a tricky area to measure. But are we, you know, is there sort of optimism we're getting better measures and in, in, in through that? I think it's a great question. So the the first point is, I think it is um, it, it's important just to note that the quality dimension is going to be very important. Uh, that that may be in relation to some of these. You know, where areas where it's hard to economise on the labour input, it might just be that it's the quality improvement that's that's the important thing. So we do have to measure it. I, I'm a bit, you know, I, I've certainly in giving talks and presentations to others at various points, they've said, oh, well, why don't we kind of just, yeah, it's just not relevant here. Well, let's just kind of give up on it. You know, productivity just doesn't apply here. And I'm very resistant to that. I think we, to the extent um, we can, we have to try and measure and we have to try and draw some conclusions about um, whether we are achieving productivity growth. Maybe it's difficult to be really granular about, you know, whether it's 1.2% or 1.5 or, or whatever, but kind of broad, broadly speaking, uh, are we achieving it? Um, you can certainly draw some conclusions at the very macro level. So in relation to an area like health, you know, what's a nation's health spend, say, as a share of GDP? What's it getting in terms of life expectancy? What's it, you know, getting in terms of years lived in good health? Uh, and that does allow you to make some broad conclusions and, and the changes in those things over time might allow you to draw some conclusions about whether we're spending our money well or achieving uh, gains. Um, and then you can get down to some more granular things. I mean, I, I'm, I'd have to refresh my memory as to the system that New Zealand has, for example, for the listing and pricing of new drugs on, on your equivalent of our pharmaceutical benefits scheme. But yeah, there is a health technology assessment process that's basically trying to, and it's inevitably clunky way, but find a kind of cost per quality adjusted life year that a particular health technology, you know, brings about or, or a pharmaceutical, what it makes possible. Now, th there'll always be controversy about that. You've got to apply discount rates. You've got to apply um, judgment about what the benefits are. You know, what, it, you know, a quality adjusted life year just sounds terribly um, bean counterish. But nonetheless, you know, it's better to have those things than not, and and to try and apply some of that rigor. I, I think that that's a sort of ex ante way of trying to make an assessment about whether a particular policy change, in this case, the listing of a drug, would would likely improve quality. Um, and it is a quality measure, right? It's not it's not about GDP per capita or anything anything like that. I think at the broad level, you know, I'd look at it. And we 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 know with health, for example, it's a very costly business. Technology in health, ironically, costs money, whereas in other sectors of the economy, it tends to save money. Um, but we think we're getting better outcomes because, you know, we we cure more things, we improve quality of life, life expectancy is longer. Still, a question about are we, you know, is is the increased resource, you know, bigger than the or smaller than the the increased. Um, the improvement in quality. But in other areas, and I'd note school education is probably an example of this, it's it's hard to make the case that we've seen big productivity gains because we, you know, we, we, we're we kind of educating, we've, if anything, reduced the ratio of, of teachers to students. We, we've got more teachers relative to students. The, the results aren't commensurately better. Uh, so I think overall, you know, it's, it's just harder to make the case. And, and yeah, so it, these things are hard to measure, but I think we can still draw some conclusions. Thank you. Um, in, oops, sorry. Um, in your uh, discussion, you talked a little bit about COVID, and there's a question there for, uh, in terms of uh, some of the uh, innovation sticking. And one of the ones, and so Mina has asked, um, what do you think about the impacts of working from home on productivity of employees? And any evidence that um, we'll sort of start returning back to sort of pre-COVID levels of, of uh, working, in, uh, in, working in, in offices? 
Yeah, I can't see a full return to, to 2019 levels. I, I just can't. I think, you know, what we'll see is the, you know, settling into some equilibrium, but somewhere between where we were in 2019 and where we were in 2020, 2021. Um, and it's partly just because, uh, you know, again, there is a historical perspective on this. Um, noting, uh, you know, 300 years ago, pretty much everyone worked from home, right? It was it was really the rise of the factory and the office ultimately that that brought the, the idea of bringing people in together to a centralised location. Yeah, previously worked from home, people worked in agriculture or they were skilled artisans, you know, in, in the home. It, it was, uh, for all the reasons I outlined about the sort of technolo technological improvements over the last 200 years, that the real cost of moving people around was just falling all the time via electricity, internal combustion engine, you know, planes, ships, whatever. Um, that ceased to happen 30 years ago, you know, in the last sort of 30 years, that the cost of moving people around has if anything become, become more expensive due to congestion, et cetera, but the cost of moving information has fallen through the floor. So there is a, just a relative price shift that underpins this. Um, it, it, um, part of the attraction of working from home is the lengthy commute that is obviated. So I, I see it sticking to, to a large extent at some level. Um, the interesting that it required COVID for us to kind of grasp the, the opportunity. It, you know, is it is it a problem for productivity? Well, it can be. There's no doubt we are learning more about the implicit value that we perhaps should have been placing on interpersonal connection and the spillover, the, the, the spread of ideas and, and the serendipitous sort of exchanges that happen in a central area. The question is, can you can you achieve both? And I'm I'm broadly an optimist that you can if you if you work at it. And you know we're still testing that out, seeing what what works. I think um, in in my neck of the woods, at least, it seems to be emerging that um, in days other than Monday and Friday seem to be a heavy you know days in the office. You know there, there's much a heavy heavier commuter traffic going into the city on those days. Um, that's a kind of natural equilibrium that you might expect to emerge, that people want to coordinate their time together, um, but have some of the benefit and flexibility of working from home where, where they can. So I think it's it's here to stay in some form. Um, I note that, you know, we ought to always have to be a bit careful because two thirds of the workforce we estimate can't work from home. So it's, it's, a, it's a subset. Um, I, I don't think it'll be massively deleterious to productivity overall if it's sort of kept within those sorts of bounds. You know, if, if it's if it's a day, a couple of days a week, um, it's unlikely to show up. I would have thought as a as a big break on aggregate productivity. Thank you. Um, Matt Goltz asked us uh, a question about uh, how could industry policy help improve our productivity and economic resilience, considering global trends and shocks. Um, yeah. It's a good question. I mean, it 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 is it's the question uh, du jour uh, about you know what's the optimal response both to perceived supply chain security issues, but also um, the world as we find it. Right. So there are there's no question that there are strategic considerations that have come into both foreign investment and also uh, trade policy issues that just weren't present you know even five years ago. Right. To the same same extent. Um, so economies do need to adjust. We've seen a big shift in policy across the developed world. The Inflation Reduction Act in the United States is a very, very significant change in favour of local content, domestic production subsidies, you know, the idea of onshoring a lot of manufacturing capability. It's not really about inflation reduction at all. It is a bit about climate, um, but it's largely about the, the United States manufacturing base. I guess we've been in many ways in this debate a bit of a trying to sound a cautionary note about thinking hard about, and I think New Zealand's in a similar position. We are, for the most part, you know, resource exporters, whether agricultural or, or mineral resource exporters. There's a, a quite a an advantageous or uh, you know um, positive role to be played by countries like Australia and New Zealand in in this world that don't necessarily involve us having to replicate the precise policy architecture that the United States and now Europe is sort of going down, um, because I think that would not necessarily represent value for money in all cases. So as a broad point, you know, I think it's important for us to remember kind of who we are and where our comparative advantages lie. But that's not to say that, you know, you, you never want to be doctrinaire. And I, you know, I'm kind of at pains to, um, it's a subtlety, but I ensure that 
people don't see us in a doctrinaire light. You know, there, there will be areas where, because of supply chain issues, there's a need either to, in extremis, bring some production onshore or to stockpile. Um, I think the climate transition does lend itself a little bit to some thinking about what sort of capability do you need onshore. Um, it's just important not not to get carried away. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, uh, question around um, um, from Andrew. Uh, what's the has, has the commission looked at how uh, productivity and inequality have interrelated? I mean, has there been? I think the question is: this, has has there been a reduction in inequality or an increase in inequality? Are there kind of correlation implications of productivity policies towards uh, inequality distribution? Yeah, I, I think it's obviously. I say this about all of them; they're all good questions, right? It's it's, it's fundamental because we wouldn't want a situation where we were pitting the years back on um, maximising incomes per capita and then finding that it, it was resulting in a massive divergence in uh, incomes across the distribution. I, I'll just give you a few reflections. I think it's the sort of thing that you just want to keep keep an eye on, right? But I'll give you three, three basic um, intu or, or kind of observations on it. The first is when you step right back and look at a very, very broad scale, um, you know, and and maybe this is not relevant to the sort of incremental changes that in Australia or New Zealand would be making, but um, rich countries have a more equal distribution of income for the most part than poorer countries. And that's partly because the sorts of things, that, you know, it's not causal, it's that there's a common thread that um, economies with sound institutions that um, prevent kind of extractive rent seeking um, will tend both to be more successful economically and um, have a more equal distribution of of income um, but you know it, it tends to be countries lower down the income ladder if you like that have uh the the, the more extreme Gini coefficients right if, if you're thinking about the measurement of these things the other point you know we looked at the question of inequality recently um has it worsened has it gotten better in in australia and and i guess the um you know when you look at, um, there, there are multiple layers to it. So you can look at the Gini coefficient in relation to sort of pre-tax income. Um, it's probably gone up maybe a little bit in Australia, but not a huge amount over like a 20, 30 year period. Certainly in the post GFC period, it's been relatively flat. And then you look at the various layers of government intervention that occur on the back of that. So, you you know, the Gini coefficient gets lowered by the tax transfer system. Both Australia and New Zealand have highly redistributive tax transfer systems, partly because of that point about the income support system I mentioned before. We don't have a contributory unemployment insurance scheme. We have a redistributive um, taxpayer funded one. Um, so we're both kind of top of the tree in terms of the redistributive effort that goes into it. So the Gini coefficient comes down as a result of that. And it, and it falls yet further in relation to consumption as opposed to income. So I I don't think there's it, it need necessarily be the case that that you know higher productivity growth leads to um, higher inequality. And I certainly think you can ensure that you have a suitably redistributive tax transfer system to soften to soften it. When we we did a little bit of modelling associated with the various interventions that we were looking at, and most of the things we were talking about, when you looked at the particular policy intervention we were talking about to try and drive improved productivity growth, for the most part, it was also militating in favour of um, greater equality, right? So, you know, controversial, but we did think about expanding access to universities, probably at the cost of you know requiring a little bit more contribution from students who tend to be higher income, certainly over their life, lifestyle, uh, life cycle. Um, we think that is productivity enhancing, but it's also equitable. And, you know, the, the, for the most part, you know, we, we, we weren't seeing, um, and maybe this is what differs from policy issues and debates in the past, we weren't seeing a massive divergence between where the equity consideration would take you and where the productivity consideration would take you. Thanks. Um, just checking this question, I'll try and group as many as I can together in terms of themes. Um, coming on a bit, a bit um, coming by time. Uh, Malcolm's asked, what are your thoughts on the non-market sector funding and investment frameworks and their tendencies towards to fund outputs rather than outputs and rather than outcomes? So um, public value, social purpose reporting. Uh, sorry, yeah, that's, yeah. 
I, so I think the question there is, is you know, what's uh, how do we? What are the implications for um, how we fund those non-market sectors and um, what we ask them to report on? Mm. To, uh, yeah. Yeah. And everything's different. You know, one of the points we made about the non-market sector is it's it's very piece by piece. You know, there are kind of individual uh, programs, individual areas of service delivery, and each, each, it's pretty heterogeneous, right? But yeah, as a general proposition, um, we 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 are funding output. We we've probably moved on. Um, both New Zealand sort of paving the way in the 1990s, Australian jurisdictions after that moved, made that transition from thinking purely in terms of inputs to, to thinking about the outputs that we were purchasing. But I think that last step of funding outcomes is, is perhaps the hardest. I mean, where um, efforts have been made to sort of go down the path of the, the more investment approach, you know, whether it be sort of impact investing, um, Social impact bonds have got their own challenges, but at least it's an effort to try and think about, you know, how do I provide an incentive for somebody, a service deliverer or a group of service deliverers to achieve the overall outcome that we're seeking rather than to deliver widgets. Um, so I, th I, I think that does remain the the challenge. Um, you know, we, we're thinking about this and we talked in the report a little bit on pr in primary health because our Medicare benefits schedule for for doctors is very it's fee for service and so there's no doubt it's funding activity. Um, activity is not always the answer, particularly for people say with chronic conditions that they're managing. You know, seeing the doctor multiple times may or may not be the right thing. What what's really necessary is to empower them to better manage their condition for for their own benefit, and it does yield cost savings as well. Um, but how do you provide an incentive for that? And so. Our government's been thinking a bit about blended funding models where you have a sort of capitation element as well as a fee-for-service element sort of combining, or at least for a defined cohort of service recipients. In the perfect world, you'd be just paying on results, right? But it's it's a difficult thing to design. And um, the, the part of the challenge, obviously, is, you know, you, you can think that you're paying for results and then... Um, as we put it in the report, you know, very small weaknesses in the incentive structure Get, get sort of driven. <laughs> you know, we've all seen it in various attempts at market, you know, involving you know some market contestability or whatever. You get a little bit of the incentive structure wrong, and it ends up causing a huge fiscal and quality deficit. And you know, so it's a hard thing to get right. The sort of payment for results. So I'm sorry I don't have a better answer, but I, that is the direction. Yes. No, that's good. Oh, there's a. Uh, um... Another question has come in there from, uh, sorry if I get the name pronunciation wrong, Alfie. Um, I uh, missed the first part of the presentation, but can you speak a little bit about the product, uh, briefly about productivity in the construction and housing sector, and what can we learn from the private sectors to, to the non-market sectors? Um, I think you've you did touch a little bit on that in terms of some of the things that we're missing out of the non-market sector in terms of prices and so forth, So, but any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, construction is one of those things. When you look at sectoral comparisons of what's happened to productivity growth in in recent years, I'd say New Zealand's probably the, probably pretty similar. Um, construction probably is one of those sectors where the the path of productivity growth just kind of stalled. Um, you know, in the last sort of twenty years, and you know, it is it is difficult. It might, maybe there's a bit of a difference between um, in Australia at least. You know, the, the sort of multi-story high density stuff, which it's got its own challenges on the labor relations front, but at least th there's a probably a greater role for of, of technology and automation, residential construction, maybe not so much. And, you know, it might be that, who knows, but it might be that part of the, the path of productivity improvement there is actually ironically shifting parts of the production process back into the manufacturing sector, you know, through prefabricated sort of materials and that sort of thing that, that are then kind of more assembled on on site. Um, but um, yeah, I think it has been a challenge in recent years to to see a lot of um, big productivity improvements in in the construction sector. Of course, both in Australia and New Zealand, you know, when you if you look over the, the broad sweep, 40 years, 30 years, you know, the bulk of the rise in um, the cost of a dwelling, for example, is is the land rather than the, the cost of construction, and you know that's a that's an issue about partly about you know planning systems and um, 
the, the speed with which and efficiency with which we're making available new um, new opportunities there. Certainly, very similar, you know, very echoes of, of the story here. I think in, in New Zealand on those on those fronts, particularly that move towards um, how can we encourage more uh, prefabrication, get economies of scale, etc., coming through in that construction space. Mm -hmm. um, just checking my list. Um, question: just Come back to um, on linking education and training. This is from Giles. Have, have you got any thoughts on how better to link education and training, immigration policy, and labour market needs? You know, what's the kind of optimal role for government here? So, just picking up on some of the things you've had in your um, presentation around you know, immigration and skills and so forth. So how do you, how, you know, how, do, how does government bring that all together in a coherent? Yeah. So, <clears throat> yeah. I think, you know, we, I guess this is one area where we tried to encourage a bit of different thinking and it wasn't necessarily original to us. There have been a few voices in the policy debate in Australia talking about making more of a shift towards wage thresholds as distinct from skilled occupation lists, for example. But I think there is a bit of a tendency, this is one of those areas where people will point to the fact that, you know, for example, the skilled list for the purposes of um, yeah, the, the, the skill shortage lists, right, that, that operate in the space of temporary and permanent migration. Um, they are yeah, slow to be updated. They're, they're out of date. They don't cover, you know, emerging new professions, occupations in tech, et cetera. Um, and similarly, in relation to training packages, the same observations made, you know, to get training packages updated and everything, that's all very slow and, and that sort of thing. And I think there's a a natural tendency then to kind of say, oh, well, we, it just needs to be faster. We just need to do it better. We just need these things to more quickly reflect the emerging um, trends in the labour market. And it's not to deny that that's possible. You can do better. You know, of course we can. I mean, we've got uh, this entity, Jobs and Skills Australia. It used to be the National Skills Commission, which is charged with putting a bit more rigour around, you know, emerging and future workforce trends. It, that is all to the good. But I think at the, there comes a point beyond which you have to start to question, well, it's just, is that the right architecture? It, it is just very difficult to foresee what the, quote, skills needs of the economy, apart from a very broad demographic kind of basis. What, what are these emerging skills needs? What are they going to be in 10 years, 20 years, whatever? Um, and, you know, I just think there are firstly good reasons why, well, perfectly understandable reasons why these things are hard to update in real time. There's also just the economist in me thinks, you know, we, we we have this notion of a skills shortage. What is it exactly? Um, it, it's it's hard to avoid the conclusion that a skills shortage is it's a bit in the eye of the beholder. It's when I can't find the person I want at the wage I'm willing to pay. And in fact, we have some official definitions that look awfully like that. Uh, and and you know mostly as economists we say, well, that's when the price needs to go up if there if there's a perceived shortage. So. Um, you know, that as the definition of a skills shortage kind of doesn't really doesn't really cut it. And that's that's why we felt that moving away from lists of occupations, which, as I said, is also a very narrow way of seeing what a person brings when they come to the country, moving to something more like a wage threshold, which is more about saying, well, what is the overarching value if, for whatever reason an employer is willing to pay a, a high premium for this individual maybe they don't actually come in an area of notional skills shortage but they've got the sort of experience and ideas and knowledge that somebody finds very valuable that's not a bad proxy for the sort of spillover benefit that might accrue to the broader community from from them coming in so i think it is a partly about um changing the way we think about the capabilities that we're bringing into the economy. And I think a similar point could be made about the vocational training system rather than sort of the view that we are training people for specific occupations on the back of readily observable capabilities, which is what our competency based training system was basically uh, premised on. You know, we are trying to skill them up or, or educate people in some broader capabilities, which they can then deploy as they navigate a career which will go through multiple different um, and changing kind of stages. And so, so I think, yeah, changing that mindset a bit is is a key part of it rather than always thinking, oh, we can just do it better. We can just better reflect the, the, the quote, labour market needs. Um, governments will struggle with, with identifying the labour market needs of the economy for, for the most part. Um, just keeping on the theme of labour markets and skills. And uh, Hillary's asked, 
Um, so in New Zealand, we, we have seen an increasing number of children who are not attending school and a growing number of children uh, reaching the age of 15 without even basic levels of literacy and numeracy. You can see that through declining PISA scores that the OECD produces. Obviously, this will have um, both long-term productivity impacts and distributional impacts. Any thoughts on how to re reverse those trends? Um, and another, and yeah. another, it's another just kind of related question, I suppose, is, is in your presentation you talked a little bit about um, schools and and, um, and and so forth and that, that need to, for our system, education system to develop adaptable and general generalizable skills. Um, how well how well placed are our, our secondary schools and primary schools to deliver on those? So just a couple, a couple of sort of questions around in the sort of just to dig into a little bit on that secondary and school stuff. Yeah, I think on the on the latter question, um, look, we you know we all kind of we, we've done work on um, we've done work on uh, the, the schools. We have an agreement between the Commonwealth and the states in Australia, n noting the role of the federation, and have noted the you know declining PISA scores or the NAPLAN, which is which is the universal thing that students do in years three, five, seven, nine. Um, I mean, PISA is a hard one. I think, you know, I look at Australia and New Zealand, you know, we, we have, um, I think this is right for New Zealand, certainly for Australia, yeah, we've declined in terms of overall performance. Um, and and maybe that, that, that's, I guess that's a face value that's concerning. The mathematics declines probably more, the more concerning of the, of the reading than the reading and the writing ones. Um, we, we're still in, kind of good company as it were like we're still in the kind of developed world company we're not right up there with um the, the very best but we're you know we're sort of peers of britain and germany and, and others um and so you know it's hard to know is that a you know is that sort of say a 20 point decline in the average pisa score um is that a meaningful thing that that's being measured hard to know each time they do a, a kind of specific module on as a partner to PISA, you know, about problem solving or that sort of thing, you know, the, the Australian experience. We, we do okay pretty well on on those. So it, I find it hard to to interpret what, you know, what what is the problem with, um, you know, we should how alarmed should we be on on PISA? I think the school attendance thing. Um, yes, I, I'd acknowledge that that is a challenge. We've got um, similar kinds of um, issues in uh, in um, you know, for example, our Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander communities, um, though we've actually seen a little bit of an uptick, I think, in school completions, um, albeit probably off a low base. Um, you know, I, I mean, the, when we've looked at the, we've done this work recently on what's called our Closing the Gap Agreement in Australia, an agreement between Commonwealth governments, state governments, and a coalition of Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander organisations. Um, and, you know, I, I, this is not a, Cure all, but it's kind of pointing to part of the problem. I guess we note that the the most successful policy interventions seem to occur in those instances where there's very strong partnership, shared decision making, um, preparedness to deliver services via um, indigenous community controlled organisations uh, that reflect the the knowledge and cultural realities on the ground. Um, you know that that's not to say there are easy answers here because I think it. You know, we we too are struggling with the school attendance issues in in certain areas. Very challenging. Um, I'm just checking my questions. Here we go. Um, just to go back to your presentation, you've got in the graph. You know, you've got a graph there. This is from Carolyn. Um, um, the productivity gains largely happen in the new to business business rather than new to industry or country world. So that chart there. How do we improve the uptake of productivity measures within business to capitalise on the, on this? How is the how is this best supported? Is there too much focus on innovation? Is I'm sorry, uh, as uh, brand new ideas? Yeah, I think I think at a policy level we tend to think of innovation in that light, and and perhaps we need to just just if not change altogether but certainly rebalance our thinking maybe a bit about well what what does innovation look like in for that 98 percent in, in australia's case the the tinkerers the 
you know, the, the sort of everyday adopters, adapters. And part of this relates back a bit to uh, the sectoral composition story that I talked about earlier. When we think, you know, for us, the primary tool of innovation policy or the biggest in terms of cost is the research and development tax incentive. Uh, and that's that's evolved over time in terms of its design, but it's basically a thing that reflects that there are information spillovers or knowledge spillovers associated with new innovation, therefore arguably underprovided in a market outcome. And you know you want to encourage it, and you, you do so via a tax incentive. When you look at the sorts of businesses that are the biggest users of that, they tend to be in the manufacturing sector, um, to some extent in agricultural. Although there's a lot of publicly funded R and D, obviously in agricultural agriculture as well. Yeah, you know, a little bit in energy and and ICT, but for the most part, it's pretty manufacturing centric, and that accords with intuition, right? That it was the sort of industrial lab attached to the manufacturing business that was sort of the big drivers of that sort of research development, private research and development sort of activity. And you think about a lot of service sectors, and you think that that's just not how they innovate. They're, they're not innovating via a big lab or or anything like that. Maybe in finance to some extent, but but it's not a big it's not a big feature. So I, I do think it's just rebalancing a bit of that thinking and thinking, well, how is it that some of these sectors are, are innovating? I mean, there are sectors, if you think about the restaurant, cafe, you know, bars, whatever, how do they innovate? Well, they're basically almost entirely innovating through uh, churn, through new business entry, you know, good concept, attracts customers. You know, this one goes out of business, something starts again on the same site, whatever. Um, that's a different model, right? That's a sort of creative destruction model of innovation. Um, and, you know, so I think understanding the way innovation occurs in different sectors, you know, we pointed out in education, we just traditionally haven't had the infrastructure, but we've now set up an agency to, to be the custodian and curator of evidence-based practice, get, get information out to teachers, try and get some observation back in, you know, from the classroom back, back to the assessors of evidence. So I think, you know, dare I say it, um, taking an almost sector-based approach, you know, just thinking a bit about how do individual parts of the economy innovate? What does innovation really look like and feel like in those sectors? And how could government sort of just create the right settings for it to occur? And it won't always be through a, you know, a, a big government intervention as such. Um, now, can you know, can we refocus, say, small and medium enterprises on on these things? I think I think so. You know, I mentioned before that our tax office provides a bit of information, or you know, back to businesses, and it certainly is capable of doing more of this. Um, just kind of almost benchmark their performance for them to benchmark their performance against peers. You know, how how do we look on the kind of productivity measure? Um, might might be imperfect, but I think you know, encouraging a bit of that um, where government can, you know, almost providing the nudge for businesses to think a bit harder about these things using digital technologies to to make that affordable. I think there is some scope for that. Cool. Thank you. Uh, just about running out of time. I've got two couple of questions I just uh, want to uh, and then we're going to run out. I think that'll that'll be it just for those uh, following along at home. Um, one is from uh, Murray um, in, in the, oh, there's a couple of here I'll just kind of um, join together. Um, so the first part of this is, as you reach your end of your term as the chair of the, of the Australian Productivity Commission, what reflections on what works for the commission in terms of impact and influence? Um, and what would you just like to see different in the future? And there was also an earlier question, which I'll just find from Christy, which was really around, um, you know, when you look back at your the work that the commission's done, um, how much of that is, how much of you um, kind of look back at evaluating the advice that you've given, um, uh, to identify, you know, what's got the most impact on your work. So just a couple of kind of commission specific type questions around your advice there. Yeah, I think on the on that sort of real time evaluation, you know, we do endeavour to look back on, you know, where we feel that we've been influential or not. Uh, it's a hard thing to measure because it's not necessarily measured in terms of recommendations accepted or not. You know, it's that, that's it's not really that. So you try and you try and bring together survey evidence. You try and think about the big things that we've really tried to um, convey, and you know how, how did we go with that? It, it's it's imperfect, but um, look, you know, to extent to an extent, you know, what are the lessons learned? I I think, and this combines a bit with Murray's question. I think one of the things 
um, and there'll be plenty of we will have plenty of critics domestically who are saying we're just not influential enough, uh, and that's fair. The, the things that I think when we're at our most influential, we're um, as I mentioned before in relation to this project, you know, thinking hard about the context in which we're operating, which is not to kind of quote water down recommendations or anything, but making sure that what we're producing is as relevant as possible for the challenges that policymakers are facing. So in the productivity context, you know, I think it was important for us to talk about climate as a key challenge. It was important for us to talk about the rise of the non-market services sector, important for us to talk about the shape of the world as we find it and this policy shift uh, and to try and think through it and as open-mindedly as possible. So I think those things are really important. I've placed a fair bit of emphasis on what, what's, um, I don't know, maybe mockingly internally <laughs> described as after sales service. But, you know, I think times were perhaps when uh, the the production of a large report was sort of taken as an end in itself, you know, and there was perhaps uh, greater reason to believe that that was the case. Increasingly, I think we have to be much more active about getting out and explaining our thinking, including to policymakers, and sometimes the subtlety of a recommendation or a finding where we agonise perhaps over a direction to go. You know, where, where we think the evidence is clear cut, where, where not so much. Um, and I think, you know, to Murray's point, you know, what when I think about what we could be doing differently, there, there's definitely scope for us to have. I mean, we, we do a range of products. We do these big blockbuster inquiries as the NZ, NZPC does as well. Uh, but there is no doubt scope for us to be also supplementing that with more of the kind of short form um, little injections into the policy debate. You know, if I'm self-critical, probably we have a tendency, even when we're doing our own self-initiated research, to feel that we have to solve a problem or to feel that we have to say something that's pretty comprehensive about the, the description of the problem. Sometimes um, just a short, sharp piece of work with a bit of evidence, even a bit of data work, can just describe a problem better and change the way people think about it. And that, that can be a, an important end in itself. Cool. Thanks, Michael. Um, look, we've run out of time, and I apologise to a couple of those folks who post questions which I haven't got to. I think I've tried to get to uh, most people on the on the on the on the Q and A. Um, look, really uh, appreciate your time. Um, great insights and um, and so forth. I, I think I really like the kind of joining up of that kind of non-market and market, and just you know bringing making sure we're bringing all together the the advice that we might get around public sector productivity and, and, and fiscal um, pre, uh, fiscal management, et cetera, uh, public sector performance with our economic performance and economic uh, policy advice. So I think that's a really important insight from the discussion today, that non-market stuff, and also thinking about the, uh, the climate change and how we bring that together. So look, really appreciate your time, uh, really valuable and uh, learned a lot from, this, from the discussion, so thank you. Um, thanks all to, also to those online for joining us today um, and for those who have given us questions. Uh, next seminar will take place on Wednesday the 23rd of August and we will host Professor Ken Gillingham from the School of the Environment at Yale University. He's an energy and environmental economist drawing on the fields of applied microeconomics, industrial organisation and energy model, model, modelling. Um, so let me just close our seminar and farewell you with a whakatoki, which says that discussion, learning, understanding and knowledge underpin the well-being of all people. Uh, mā te korero, kā mohio, mā te ma mohio, kā marama, mā te marama, kā mātou, mā te mātou, kā ora ta iwi, hui e, hui e, taiki e. So thanks very much. Uh, again, thanks, Michael. Um, thanks again for everyone participating. Um, Matewa. Thanks, James. Thanks for having me. Uh, really appreciate it.